Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome uh, this evening to our Milwaukee Preservation Alliance webinar uh, with Milwaukee Film. We're so excited to have all of you here today. My name is Jeremy Ebersole. I'm the executive director of the Milwaukee Preservation Alliance, uh, and we're just super, uh, super excited uh, to, um, to be able to present this webinar this evening uh, in partnership with Milwaukee Film on, uh, on the historic uh, Oriental Theater, which I know everybody is dying to get back inside. Uh, and we're really excited to be able to, uh, to present uh, this little sneak peek. Um, we have a huge turnout tonight, so we're so grateful to all of you for being here uh, and for your interest uh, in, in what we're doing this evening. Just a quick introduction. Uh, we're going to have Kristen Heller and Ryan Putsky from uh, Milwaukee Film uh, present uh, with us this evening. It's just been an absolute pleasure to partner with them. A couple quick housekeeping items um, before, um, before we get started. Uh, the, the webinar is being recorded this evening. Uh, so if you want to watch it again uh, or, or, or have friends uh, who were not able to see it, um, we will be sending that link out uh, to everyone uh, who registered and it will be up on our website uh, as well. Um, the timeline for this evening uh, is, uh, is essentially, uh, I will be giving a very brief introduction uh, here um, we'll hear from our wonderful sponsors at the Kavala Washako Architects um, that will take roughly 10 minutes or so uh, and then uh, we'll kick it over um, to Ryan and Kristen to go into a little bit of history uh, and information on the on the restoration of the theater and why it's so important to to keep these amazing buildings around. Um, if you have questions during the presentation just go ahead and put those in the Q&A uh, will be the best place that you can use the chat feature there as well uh, for uh, kind of to talk amongst uh, to talk amongst yourselves. We'll see that as well, but, but please put questions for the panelists uh, in the in the Q&A section uh, there. And then we will uh, I will uh, have some Q&A time at the end for about 10 minutes and we'll try to wrap up around uh, around seven o'clock. Uh, so a little bit about the MPA uh, for everyone. I know many of you uh, are, uh, are good friends. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. Some of you may be new to the Milwaukee Preservation Alliance. Um, our mission uh, at the MPA is to promote the stewardship and awareness of historic, cultural, and economic value of, uh, of Milwaukee's built heritage. We aim to strengthen Milwaukee's neighborhoods by advocating for preservation in order to foster strong and vibrant communities. And our vision, uh, as you see here on the screen, is to make preservation mainstream uh, by demonstrating to residents, business owners, and building owners the link between historic preservation and viable economic development. Uh, so we essentially are a historic preservation advocacy nonprofit here in, uh, in the city of Milwaukee who works to, to do programs like this uh, and advocacy to ensure that the places uh, that make Milwaukee so special are around for years to come. We do that in a number of ways, including programs uh, like this that we do throughout the year on preservation, on advocacy, how to advocate uh, on buildings uh, that, that are really special that, ha that have been restored. Um, we've done a lot of advocacy uh, with, uh, with the Soldier's Home. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, Milwaukee Soldier's Home. Uh, very excited uh, that after 10 years of working on that project, uh, a number of buildings there, including Old Main, uh, reopened just last week uh, in service to veterans um, uh, as housing for, for homeless veterans after 30 years uh, of being vacant. Also done a number of uh, a good bit of work with uh, Mitchell Park Domes to advocate for their preservation. Um, done some work uh, with individual buildings as well, things like the Forest Home Library, uh, are also um, advocating uh, currently uh, for the preservation of the Puddler's Cottages in Bayview that you see here at the top of the screen. Um, I've advocated for historic tax credits that help to make many projects possible, including the one that we'll hear about today, uh, and are just uh, here as a resource behind the scenes as well um, for, for anyone to, to be able to reach out to us to help, under, to help uh, with, with resources for, uh, for preserving places uh, that, that matter to them, whether it be commercial or, uh, or, or residential buildings. We're here uh, to, help, uh, to help you and to help others in Milwaukee uh, keep the places uh, in Milwaukee that, that really matter to us. We are a, um, we are a nonprofit organization uh, and your, uh, your support is really what allows us to continue to do the good work that we do. Uh, if you appreciate uh, and enjoy this evening's presentation, I encourage you uh, to, uh, to visit our website, uh, visit our social media pages, follow us. You can also sign up for our email list. 
Uh, and of course, um, you can become a member uh, or, or donate there online uh, if you feel so, uh, so inclined. We would certainly appreciate it again. All of this work uh, is possible um, because, because of the, the, the generosity uh, of people like you. So thank you so much uh, for considering and for following. Uh, next slide. Uh, one thing that we have, uh, have started to do um, uh, with our programs in the last year or so uh, uh, is a land acknowledgement, which we believe is really important uh, to do to acknowledge, again, as we're protecting places that are currently on the landscape here in Milwaukee, to recognize that we are not the first uh, or the only stewards of this land. And so in that, in that vein, we'd like to acknowledge in Milwaukee that we are on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homeland along the southwest shores of Michigami, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinnick rivers meet and people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. And with that, uh, I want to uh, thank profusely our wonderful sponsors uh, at the Kavala Washako Architects uh, and give them just a few minutes uh, to talk to you about the wonderful things that they're, that they're up to. So I'll kick it over uh, to Kevin. Uh, hello, uh, thank you, uh, Jeremy. Um, my name is uh, Kevin Hardman, and I'm with the uh, uh, Kubala Oshatko Architects. And we are uh, architectural designers, interior designers, and urban designers. And we uh, deeply love Milwaukee, and we deeply love uh, the richness of Milwaukee's heritage. So we couldn't be more uh, proud to be supporting the Milwaukee Preservation Alliance. And it's, we're so heartened that the board has brought Jeremy on over this uh, last year. And uh, if everyone could uh, uh, see to it to support MPA in their own way. Uh, at uh, Kabbalah Washako, uh, one of our strongest values is uh, uh, egoless collaboration. So you get three of us to introduce ourselves. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Vince Micah. Kevin, thank you. And uh, uh, we at TKWA, we have a deep experience when it comes to managing the local, state, and national historic reg registration and rehabilitation processes. Um, from complex and sensitive projects like the award-winning addition to the Frank Lloyd Wright First Unitarian Society, to adaptive reuse efforts like the Charmant Hotel, pictured in the center here, um, to the Oriental Theater, one of Milwaukee's historic gems that we've had the distinct pleasure of um, being involved with. And at this point, I'd like to introduce to you Therese Hansen, the project architect that has led the efforts of the restoration for the Oriental Theater. Thanks, Vince. Hey, everybody. I'm Therese Hansen. I'm one of the project architects that's been involved with the renovations. Uh, the Oriental Theater is certainly one of the most beautiful examples of the early 20th century cinema houses in the nation. And I'm sure it has a really special place in the memories of so many of you that have joined us here tonight. We're really lucky to have this unique cultural space right in our neighborhood and for it to be largely in the same condition as it was on opening day in 1927. So much of that historical fabric is still intact. Our team at TKWA has been really honored to partner with Milwaukee Film on this really important project. They have such an admirable dedication to preserving all of the unique details in this theater while simultaneously upgrading all the comfort and technical aspects so that we're all able to enjoy top of the line film experience at the Oriental. So with that, let me pass it back to Jeremy to get this started. Great, thank you so much, Therese and everyone at TKWA. Uh, really, again, really appreciate um, your work and their sponsorship. Uh, again, without, uh, without that, this program uh, would not have been possible. Uh, with that then, uh, without any further ado, I am very happy to kick it over to Ryan to begin. The reason we all came this evening for Oriental Theater, Milwaukee Film, Restore the Gem. Thanks so much. Okay, everybody. So uh, I've been tasked tonight with telling you a little bit of the history and some strange little tidbits of, of information about the Oriental Theater. And I thought it was kind of appropriate tonight to start out just with one of the questions that I get asked most frequently, why 
our movie palace is a thing. And to really answer that question, we need to start out with just kind of a background on film. So film really starts uh, being a thing in the middle of the 19th century, but it doesn't really catch up technologically until the 1890s. Um, at that point, you're really seeing just kind of boardwalk curiosities, uh, you know, uh, horses galloping, uh, ladies dancing, maybe showing off some ankle if you put in an extra nickel or something like that. It's, you know, it's really just kind of an amusement kind of situation. And then uh, as you gradually move into the 1890s and into the, the 1900s, you start seeing um, more technical movement with the film situation. So you start out with the guys like the Lumiere brothers who are doing street scenes and kind of trying to demonstrate what the possibilities are with film as a medium. Uh, and then you eventually start moving more into a narrative uh, direction with film as a medium. And the one film I, I think is a, a good place to start out with is 1902's A Trip to the Moon, which is a, a French film. And it was uh, groundbreaking at its time because A, it was a very expensive film to make, and B, it was a whole 18 minutes. Uh, at the time, that would have been two full reels, which would have required or at least uh, really benefited from having two projectors run side by side. That's not to say that when it was shown, it always was, but it looked better when you did. So that's kind of where you start seeing actual Nickelodeons and um, kind of the development of film as a form of show or entertainment. So from there, um, you start seeing more vaudeville houses and opera houses branching into film uh, because it's a bit more of an accessible and uh, oftentimes cheaper uh, way to get an audience into the seats. And so also it, it's beneficial in as much for say opera, if you don't know Italian or German, it's easier to get into. If you can't read, it's not necessarily gonna break it for you, but it's gonna be helpful. Uh, in any event, by the time you get to about 1915, you get a movie called Birth of a Nation, uh, which is over three hours long, uh, which I believe uh, was about, ten, uh, excuse me, 12 reels, which uh, required a skilled projections. Um, also of note, uh, Birth of a Nation takes in a little over $10 million in box office. Um, and that's just what they have recorded. It may, that number may actually be somewhere closer to $50 million. And that's where you really start seeing movie theaters just being built everywhere. Uh, also fun kind of aside to 1915, that is the year that the Downer Theater opened here in Milwaukee. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's uh, a significant thing because the Downer Theater has, uh, is the oldest operating theater left in the city of Milwaukee. So um, that is going to take us into a little slide show I have built for you. And we're gonna start out with looking at the Alhambra Theater. So the Alhambra Theater is um, not actually a movie palace as such. It was built as uh, an opera house. Um, it was essentially the Eline or Schlitz family uh, response to Paps Theater. So by 1912 or so, they're actually putting in a projection booth so that they can showcase films. Uh, also, just from looking at, at that picture, hopefully you can kind of tell that there are a lot of seats in there. Uh, at the time, they actually built it as the largest movie theater in the world, and it did indeed sit over 3,000 people. Uh, that's not to say that they were still that, but it's still quite a number and still quite a feat. Um, so from here, we're kind of moving into the question of what is a movie palace? And following the Alhambra's lead here, uh, it's usually got very decorative embellishments, uh, oftentimes with a theme like Greek or Roman, Egyptian or Arabic, uh, French or Italian, Spanish, Moorish. Uh, touching on that Moorish for a bit, the Alhambra is a uh, palace in the mountains in Spain. Um, built by one of the Moorish uh, 
Emirates um, when Spain was occupied by the, the Moors uh, back in the ninth century uh, AD. And as you can see, this uh, Alhambra theater here really doesn't really have any of that flavor to it. Definitely really cool to look at, but just doesn't really have anything Moorish to it. So that said, um, movie palaces are also purpose-built for movies, and they usually also have a theatrical, theatrical capability, meaning they have a stage. Um, oftentimes, of course, these uh, theaters would have sort of a program where you, they would uh, have a newsreel and then a vaudeville act, then the actual film, and then maybe you'd have a cartoon for the kiddies or you know something of that nature. Um, and of course, uh, one of the other requirements for a movie palace is that it has a large seating capacity. And generally speaking, these palaces are built between 1920 and 1929. That's not totally specific to it, but generally that's kind of where it is. And I'm trying to keep this kind of condensed, so don't mind me if I'm a little reductive with it. But uh, first thing we're going to start out, out with before we really jump into the Oriental Theater is the Sachs Brothers. And the Sachs Brothers uh, did operate the Alhambra for a bit, but where they started out, well, sorry, uh, we're actually going to start out looking at a couple of their first proper movie palaces here. So on the left, we see the Tower Theater from 1921, and uh, on the right side of your screen, you see the Wisconsin Theater from 1924. Uh, but where the Sachs Brothers started out is here with the Theatorium. Now, this one is really fun for me to note. It was built in 1906, and it was a Hales, tu uh, Hales Tour Car Theater. And what that means is it had a, fa a false floor, and uh, what they did was they specialized in showing films that were essentially like a train on tracks just going down the landscape or a boat floating out at sea. And what's important about that false floor is they would actually have it hooked up to a mechanism that uh, some stagehands would be actually physically rocking so that you would feel like you were on a train or a boat. And this was a hugely popular thing at the time. So kind of a big gap between that and say one of those movie palaces that we just, that we just looked at here, big gap. But that said, we eventually end up here at the Oriental Theater in 1927. And uh, the Sachs Brothers actually had sort of a series of movie palaces that they built with the Oriental Theater. Uh, one of those is the Egyptian Theater, which has an Egyptian theme. Uh, also, uh, they uh, have the Garfield Theater, which had murals with, uh, with Greek and Roman goddesses on it, and they were planning the Arabia Theater, but unfortunately that never got off the ground. Uh, worth noting the, uh, uh, I think, oh, um, the Egyptian theater has been demolished and so has the Wisconsin, but the Tower Theater and the Garfield are still standing. And both of those are actually in sort of a uh, development state to be uh, reinvigorated. So something to check out on your own time. Uh, but anyway, the Oriental Theater was built in 1927 at the expense of $1.5 million. And that roughly breaks out, if you check an inflation calculator, to about $22.5 million in today's money. Uh, the land that the theater was built on was owned by Moses Annenberg. If the name isn't familiar to you, uh, he was kind of a newspaper magnet, magnate. And uh, he was um, probably most famous for buying a, a, a racing um, uh, newspaper, I can't think of the name of it anyway, uh, and he was uh, later indicted for uh, uh, tax evasion in the later 30s, um, and then his son actually took up a business, and uh, he ended up being a, uh, an ambassador to the United Kingdom uh, under the Nixon administration, so kind of an interesting train of, of fortune there. Uh, anyway, um, if you can look at the theater, uh, the uh, image on the right side, you may see some 
the, uh, the furniture there that should look a little bit familiar. And much of, I shouldn't say much, but some of that furniture is still existing here in the theater today. Like I can see a couch and we have one of those couches. There's one of uh, the much beloved throne chairs and uh, I can just make out one of the chairs that I am actually sitting in at this very moment. So um, these are very fancy and lavish uh, decorations that they've made for this theater and they, they truly spared no expense and they made sure that they broadcast it in all of their advertising. Now, the reason that they, they would have these themes and they would do this lavishness is that they wanted to bring you to their theater. Uh, as it happens, the Sachs brothers uh, sort of corner, cornered the market here in southeastern Wisconsin. But uh, for years, uh, the Warner Brothers and the Fox Theater chain, uh, both of whom you probably know better today for actually making movies, and indeed they were doing that uh, especially at the time too, but uh, they did both things that um, got into some lawsuit troubles back in the 1950s. Anyway, uh, at the time, the Oriental Theater was meant to be one of the most technical, technologically advanced theaters at the time. And surely it probably was uh, for at least a couple months. Uh, the, the biggest film of note uh, in 1927, besides Wings, which did a fantastic job at the first annual Academy Awards that year, was Jazz Singer, which is the first um, popular sound film. And uh, that was done via a method called Vitaphone, which uh, actually was a sound on disc uh, platform. So there was actually uh, a means by which that they were actually syncing the image on screen to a vinyl record disc. Um, and this is really the birth of the talkies, the, the sound and film era. So in a matter of months after the Oriental opens, it's already obsolete. You don't really see that kind of technological advancement really until later in the 20th century with you know, microchips. Uh, but that's more of an accident than really uh, anything else. Anyway, the uh, Sachs brothers then actually make the very smart move. Well, maybe not the smart move, but uh, they get out of the movie game in 1928 and sell to another company who ends up selling to Fox Theaters. And I could keep telling you uh, all the different owners of the theater, but it really gets to be a, a long twisting road of different owners. Uh, anyway, most of note, uh, we're going to jump to the post war years here. And this is where you start seeing uh, all of these really celebrated uh, movie palaces disappear and uh, many of them end up getting demolished or totally forgotten. Um, and really that almost happened here at the Oriental. It just happened to be in a really, really good location. Uh, it never really lost its audience here at the Oriental as opposed to other parts of Milwaukee that were going, going under very significant changes, largely under uh, urban renewal settings and um, for anybody who's not historian here, that's just a nice way of saying that there was a lot of white flight and racism, which uh, also going back to Birth of a Nation and The Jazz Singer, those are both uh, really easily considered racist movies today, but they were hugely, massively popular at the time. Um, in any event, uh, later in 1972, the theater was bought by uh, a group of guys named the Pritchett Brothers, and the Pritchett Brothers were electricians. Uh, they actually bought the property that the Oriental Theater is on, hoping to demolish the building and then build a general store, a hardware store. Uh, as it happened, they actually got into the building, realized what it was, and decided that they were going to save it, which is kind of an uncommon thing for the 60s and 70s, uh, again, where you're seeing a lot of these theaters being demolished and uh, the Alhambra at the time uh, actually was demolished in the early 60s uh, in the hopes of building a uh, high rise and that never manifested. And uh, if I remember right, the developers uh, were actually, if not sued, indicted. Uh, in any event, um, 
at this time in the 70s uh, and 60s and 70s, really, you're seeing a lot of musicals and uh, concert acts happening instead of just film as uh, it's better known today. Um, so we're going to start out, I guess, just uh, talking a little bit about some of those uh, acts and performances that were here. And uh, I've never really been able to track down any of the uh, musical or Broadway plays that were here at the, at the theater. Uh, but I did have somebody mention that they saw Richard Burton here in My Fair Lady. Um, I can't specify that, but I can specify that Camelot played here in 1963 and 64. And uh, at some point, Richard Burton was attached to that. So maybe it was that instead. Uh, anyway, uh, for the music uh, performances, we've had some really great performers here. Uh, one of my favorites, you're going to hear a few of my favorites, but um, start out with Bob Dylan in 1964. Uh, the story goes, and this is actually verified as well, uh, he only gets two, set, two songs into his set before the PA breaks. He invites the audience onto the stage so that they could home, keep listening to music, but then he gives up. So kind of a bummer for Bob Dylan fans back in 1964. Uh, also of note uh, is Iggy Pop in 1977. And this is of note for two reasons. Uh, one, he's on the tour for The Idiot right now, which is one of my favorite albums. And also I think a lot of people would kind of geek out over this. Uh, he was touring with David, Bo uh, David Bowie who was playing uh, pianos and uh, doing backup vocals for that. And one of my favorites, uh, stories that anybody has ever come up to me with that is uh, uh, a young man came up to me and told me that his uh, uncle was here for that performance and he had actually managed to sneak into the dressing room and he claims that he stole uh, David Bowie or Iggy Pop's mascara which is just amazing when you think about it. So um, we've also got uh, Devo in the Talking Heads in 1980. Uh, of course, in 1981, you have the very famous incident where the pretenders uh, were performing here at the Oriental and the tour van of their opening band uh, breaks down outside Milwaukee. So Chrissy Hind actually walks outside and uh, just down the street from the theater, she finds the violent femmes. Um, also, some other names of, of good note here. We have uh, R.E.M., New Order, Stevie Ray Vaughan, In Excess, Wandy, Patti Smith, The Kinks, Super Tramp, and Deep Purple. And Deep Purple is also one I, I kind of like to mention because uh, the legend goes that one of the holes that we had in our ceiling that we're going to be seeing in just a moment that's been fixed uh, is actually the result of Deep Purple, who was at the time billed as the loudest band in the world. Um, also, you have some comedy performances by uh, Jay Leno and Jerry Seinfeld. And Jerry Seinfeld actually, surprisingly, stops by the theater every once in a while when he's in town. Um, other things I'd like to throw in there is, of course, uh, the Oriental holds the uh, national national record for the longest running engagement of the film. Uh, that is the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which we've been showing since January of 1978. Uh, you'll know, notice again, national record on that, the uh, actual world record for any, any film engagement is still Rocky Horror, uh, but it is the Museum Lichtspiel in Munich, Germany, uh, who has been playing Rocky Horror since uh, I believe it was June of 1976. Uh, it wasn't until 1977 that it was really a big, uh, cold hit here in the states but uh, the initial beginnings of that is in 1976 in uh, in new york um, and also fun fun fact uh, the thing that kind of put an end to the musical performances here was when uh, the small theaters were installed in 1988 and it's of a special note that those small theaters were installed in such a way that uh, they could be removed if we ever wanted to. Unfortunately, I don't see that ever happening. Uh, and you'll also see some of, some of the pictures for the, the now completed renovations for those in a moment. And we're very excited to have uh, this entire building just looking beautiful, which again, you're gonna see some wonderful pictures in just a moment. Uh, 
Kristen is going to share some of the, some of those with you in uh, just a moment. Thank you, Ryan. That was a lovely presentation. And now I'm going to uh, show you guys what we've been doing since we took over the Oriental and started doing work. And I'm Kristen Heller. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Milwaukee Film. So let me get into this. All right, well, thank you for joining us. And I'm glad that I get to show you guys what we've been doing because we've been closed due to the COVID-19 shutdown. Uh, first, I wanted to give a brief overview of our phase of construction because there's a lot that I'm not going to be showing in this presentation. This presentation will be mostly focused on our main house and the restoration there, but we've been doing so much in the past several years. So I just wanted to give a brief overview of those phases. Um, in 2018, when we took over, we completely redid the ground floor restrooms. Uh, we did a little small retail space that's next to the restrooms and we added in new screens, projection and sound equipment to all three houses. In our second phase of construction, we remodeled our West House. We also improved the sound separation between theaters, which means when you're in one movie, you can't hear uh, the movie in the next house because you shouldn't. Uh, and then we also changed out the acoustical panels in that main house. We improved the main theater projection booths and we installed a fire alarm throughout the entire cinema and remodeled our, our concession stand. This past year, since the shutdown, we've been very busy. We remodeled our main house ground floor. We redid the ceiling restoration above that same section. And we changed out the demo rack and theater lights, which you'll see as we get into the visuals. We made all of our organ spaces uh, ready for the organ. We did a East Theater remodel and we improved our HVAC system so that it is safer for people to breathe when they come back into the theater. This upcoming year, we will be working on donor recognition and we will also be redoing our balcony and restoring the plaster ceiling above our balcony. And then we will determine future projects from there. So to do a project like this, it is very, very expensive. And we had so many wonderful supporters. Uh, we, a few years ago, starting in 2017, ending in 2018, we had a, actually I believe ending in 2019, um, we had a large capital campaign where we raised over $10 million. And six of those million were dedicated for construction. The other ones, uh, the other 4 million went into a reserve as well as operating funds. But we wanted to really invest in this building. And that was made possible with over 900 contributors, including uh, several lead donors, including Chris Abley, Donald and Donald Baumgartner, the Hertzfeld Foundation, Sheldon and Marianne Lubar, the Allen H and Suzanne, and Suzanne L. Selig, and the Buki Family Foundation. So the, none of this that I'm about to show you would have been possible without these people. So thank you to everyone that contributed to our capital campaign. We also will be receiving additional funds to for, fund future projects for this uh, through historic tax credits. Um, to be, to be eligible for historic tax credits, you have to become a registered historic place. And so we're in the process of making the Oriental on that registry. Um, once, involved, once you're designated as a historic place, uh, you have to have everything that you do to the historic fiber approved by the National Park Service. That may sound scary. I would actually say it's, it's not as you would think, it is actually a pretty easy process, especially if you have a really wonderful architecture team like we do, uh, who makes it quite seamless. And you, luckily, we wanted to truly restore the building. So we are pretty much in line with the National Park Service with, with a lot of that work. So, and as a nonprofit, we are pursuing state historic tax credits uh, because we could not pursue the federal ones without being a for-profit. So next, I wanted to go into some of our plaster repair uh, because we had plaster damage mainly in the main house, but throughout all the houses. So this is what our side house looked, one of our side houses looked like when we got started. And if you look in that blue dome, you can see there's a lot of different patches from different damage over the years. That could be from an HVAC leak, that could be from a number of other things. 
but there was substantial damage and you can see it also with the slide as well. There were just, just from years and years of little bits of damage, but also age, some of the plaster had fallen off and it was looking a little scuzzy. Um, and these, these side houses you, I should note, are not historical. These high side houses were built out in 1987. And that's when it went, the Oriental went from being a 2000 seat single house to a 1000 seat main house with 250 seats in each of the side houses approximately. And so this, is, this, this room is not historical at all, but you, you could see that the, but each, in each side house, one of the walls is, is historic because it was part of the original theater. So next I'll show you what one of these houses looks like once it was finished. So this is how it looks once it's been restored. Um, and this was our West Theater when we redid it a year or so ago. And so you can see that we went in and we cleaned up the dome it, and then we also changed out the light fixture. I don't know if you can see, but if you look very closely in the upper, in the right corner of that dome, you can see that there's these little lines and those are cables because actually this is, if you are actually looking up underneath, it's not a true dome. One side is domed and then the other side extends because originally the two domes in the side houses were connected because they were part of the main house. It was a single huge dome. And so each of them has these little sections. So it would have been really beautiful to see it back in the day when it was all one big dome, but we have it cleaned up so it looks nice from this perspective. Next, I'll talk about plaster in the main house. So when we took over the Oriental in July of 2018, actually just prior to us taking it over, we got a phone call in June of 2018 saying that there was plaster falling. And what had happened was that there was ish an issue with the roof and it had caused a lot of damage and there was just chunks of plaster falling and hitting the seats. And so the first thing we did was we worked with our landlord and they stepped in in a real wonderful way and not only put out a new roof for the building, but they also, or for this section of the building, but they also brought in a structural engineer. Sorry, that's my dog, Lucy. She says hi to all of you. Um, we brought in a structural engineer who went and tested each of the, all the, all of the plaster, not just where it was visibly damaged, but every inch of the, of the ceiling to make sure what was safe. And then we removed anything that was weak. And then we put up these boards because we were not able to do the restoration at that time. And so these boards were actually, they may look like they're just like lightly attached. They're actually attached to the steel mesh that's above uh, the plaster. So it's a very strong structural attachment. And what I like about this, the, this these photos is that it also shows you just how dirty the ceiling was when we got started. It is, it was incredibly dingy and it like the ceiling was this really, really dark gray tone that was darker in some spots than others. Uh, and the medallion was this really dark burn sienna color. And so we really didn't, didn't know what to expect as we were going into it and what the true color would be as we went exploring. But this is sort of uh, a good visual of the starting point for that. So this is a bit more uh, just to show some more of the damage there was. This is also from that same roof leak. It was pretty substantial down the walls. Um, and there were, there were some areas where, as you can see here, where like entire chunks had fallen and entire pieces had broken off. And so there was a, it was very visibly poured down from this leak. But there was also damage from just age over the years. This, this space had been used and used for rock concerts. and it really showed like like the its age was really showing in certain spots and so that's sort of that was sort of our starting point and so this past year when the COVID-19 shut down us shut us down in March we decided that this would be the time to do the main house prior to that we weren't quite sure when we would schedule it out just because like we knew this process would be about four months and taking the main house offline for four months it was pretty daunting. 
But once we suddenly had four months of time, it seemed like a pretty good idea. Um, and so this is what the main house looked like once we cleared out all the seats, sanded down the floors and started to patch everything up because we knew we were not putting the seats back exactly where they had been. So then we began work, once the seats were cleared out, we began work on the ceiling restoration. The pasta restoration work was done by Conrad Schmidt Studios, which is a firm based in New Berlin, Wisconsin. And for the ceiling plaster, they used these lifts to access it and they had to mimic the historic spoon texture and so that the repaired sections would blend seamlessly in with the rest of the ceiling. For the wall sections, uh, there were like a lot of different techniques were used. Uh, and some of them were entire, where entire pieces had broken off. What, the, what we would do, or what they would do, I should say, is that in many, many cases, they would take a mold of a section that was not damaged, and they would use that to recreate that missing plaster section. And so what you're seeing in these photos is the once that's installed, how they do a base color on top, preparing to do the decorative painting work. During the plaster restoration stage, uh, we took samples of the ceiling so that we could determine what the original paint color of the ceiling was. From stripping down the like layers and layers of grime, we were able to discover that the original color was actually, we had originally thought it might be tan. It turned out it was a greenish color with silver highlights. And so Conrad Schmidt was able to match the green color and that is what is being applied in this picture. We tried to match the silver highlights, but using a modern paint, it was hard to recreate it. And we thought that using the silver that we had, it looked distracting. So in the end, we opted for a more subtle gold hue and that felt more true to the room. We also had the center medallion cleaned, which revealed that it was really a beautiful red and gold tone. Uh, and we were, once we sort of, we saw this, we were so in love with it. We incorporated some spotlights into our lighting design so that when our patrons would come in for a film, they could, they could this medallion would be highlighted just because it was so stunning. And I, I included this picture just so you could see just how striking it was once we started adding the paint color back in. And you could sort of see how vibrant it was back in the day and how much we had been missing out by not having it be this color. And so, and this is the flat color before the metallic highlight was added in. Next, I'm gonna show some improvements in regards to seating and textiles. Uh, this picture shows our main house prior to any work being done. Um, and so you can see the old chairs this, and the carpeting <coughs> and some very, very tan acoustical paneling. And this photo sort of shows just how damaged that acoustical paneling was. There's all sorts of rips and tears and there were stains everywhere. You could even see where there was like a little divot carved in so it could have a, a lighting switch location. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is part of that 1986 multiplexing. So none of these back walls are actually historic. And so one thing that we did uh, a little over a year ago is that we, when we improved the sound isolation, sound isolation between the theaters, we put in new acoustical paneling. And we thought that this tone worked better with the room. And I'll show a detail on that uh, fabric in a little bit. But this was the first part of it. And you can sort of see the crown molding that we added in along the top. So these were some of the seats that were in the balcony when we started. Uh, and we, this is where we sort of, we took our cues from these seats in terms of what we would do for the seating throughout the theater. We weren't certain, and I'll explain in a little bit, uh, but we weren't certain if these were original to the building, but they had elements that allowed us to know that they were from the 1920s, which we, and, we, and they had a lot of elements that we love, such as the curve shape, and this wooden backplate. The seat standards that had been installed in the 1980s, such as this one from the side house, were very plain and lacking of any detail. 
And they also didn't have a whole lot in terms of lighting. As you can see, there's only one a light on this seat standard, but not on the next one in front of it. And so we like we feel like that we felt that and our lighting designer confirmed it that we, we knew that this was not up to code and we knew it was hard for our patrons to see where they were going. So we wanted to improve this. As I mentioned, the original standards in the balcony were from the 1920s, but we weren't certain that they were original to the building. And it's because of this pharaoh design. And so these seat standards had an Egyptian theme to them. Uh, and what we, we learned was that these seat standards were used in the Egyptian theater that Ryan mentioned, uh, which this is a photo from 1926, but the uh, Egyptian opened in 1927 along with the Oriental, but a few months apart. So our thought was possibly, you know, this is a, these are some photos of the Egyptian and like when you could see the same seats there, we thought maybe there was a chance that maybe when this theater had shut down, that in need of seats for the, its balcony, the Oriental received seats from the theater. And that's why there were these 1920s seats, but that maybe they didn't belong to the Oriental. And then we started going through some of these photos from when the Oriental opened. And these provide a lot of good clues for how we would design things such as they influence the carpet patterns that we chose. But they also helped us confirm that if you look at the photo on the right, and at the very bottom in the center where there's, we highlighted it, we were actually able to reveal that these actually were in fact the seat standards that had appeared in the Oriental when it opened. So in this very you know, Oriental themed house, there were some very Egyptian seats. So our, our little hunch is that maybe because another theater was getting these standards, possibly the people that bought, built the Oriental got a little bit of a deal on them. And so they just use them. So we're gonna, we're, we're, so we're, we will be incorporating those into our balcony design. Since those seat standards only exist in the balcony and we don't have them throughout the house, we needed something that we could use throughout our houses. So we chose a very simple standard uh, that we could color black and gold. And then we added in the little elephant logo that Milwaukee Film uses as part of our Oriental branding. Uh, this is Vince, who you heard a little earlier from TKWA, holding up the mock-up. Uh, since this was the mock-up, the elephant's facing the wrong way. Uh, if you're in the theater, the elephant always faces the screen. And so this shows uh, some of the, a lot of the textiles that we used and the finishes that we used throughout the main house. So you can see the carpeting section down below. It was influenced by that historic photo I showed at the lobby. It had kind of like a, a lot of sort of like, like a lot of different carpets patched together. Um, we chose uh, red jewel tone hues because that was very common in the 1920s. So we thought it harkened back to that historic fiber that we wanted to sort of bring into a new seat. And so we thought that was very important. Oops. Uh, and then uh, there was also uh, the uh, black and gold fabric shown previously there uh, for the acoustical panels. And so this shows those seats on the ground floor. This photo on the left, I apologize for the dust, you know, it, like the theater had not been quite clean, uh, but this is how they the seats look installed on the ground floor. And then on the right, you can see what we're thinking about trying to explore for the balcony, uh, where we're trying to retrofit those seat standards to fit with our new seats. Uh, and to retrofit, which means in which you're welding, um, we actually have to strip all the paint off of it. So we're actually going to, to if we do, if we're able to do this, we're going to paint them black and then hand paint them gold, all the accents. So the balcony actually will have the original seat standards from the 1920s. And then this photo is, I like because it shows off the beautifully done ceiling, uh, which is illuminated. And this is, this is what the house looks like when we have our cleaning lights on. But I also wanted to uh, talk a little bit about our organ. And we were getting all of our organ spaces ready this past year. So when Milwaukee Film took over the Oriental, the organ was actually missing because um, the organization that had an organ in the, in the Oriental decided to remove it prior to us occupying it. 
so we knew we, we knew we needed we wanted to incorporate an organ into the space and we were actually able to find a really incredible partner um, to help make that happen and so that once we did we started getting the spaces ready for it and so the spaces that we've been getting ready is if you see right near the stage there's like a little box near the footage of the stage that's where the organ goes that is where the lift is and so we've been repairing that and then if you look to the left and right of the stage just up above there are these two curtain sections and those are the organ chambers and so this is what the inside of those looks like and so we've been preparing those and you can see uh, one of the air pipes uh, that is running through and it runs underneath the stage as well into the console, which is what goes into the organ lift. So we've been preparing all of that. And this is what the organ's going to look like. Um, and this is a 1925 Wurlitzer pipe organ. And so it is actually a true pipe organ from the 1920s that we were able to uh, have installed by J.O. Weiler Incorporated, uh, which is based in Chicago, and they are they are our partners with this. This organ, uh, this organ is about ninety four years old. Um, actually, I think my notes are old. I think it's more like ninety five, ninety six. Uh, but uh, when the installation is complete, because this is a a full complete, there are no parts added in or taken out. This is a full complete organ. It will sound exactly as it sounded in the 1920s once it's installed. Uh, this, this particular organ began its life at the Paramount Theater in Atlanta, and that's where it remained until the 1950s. And then I believe it was owned by a private family before uh, J.L. Weiler was able to obtain it. So it is in incredible condition and it is going to sound amazing once it's installed. Uh, finally, the, one of the last pieces I want to talk about is uh, one of the projects that we didn't fully anticipate we were going to do, but then learned that we needed to do was we needed to upgrade our lighting board. Uh, prior to this past year, if you had to turn on the lights in the main house, this is how you did it. Uh, you can see a bunch of blue tape with arrows. We would have to send a manager backstage and they'd have to flip all these switches and that is how all the individual lights got turned on. Um, is this very cool Frankenstein board. Uh, it was installed by Uline and Ortman as the electricians. This is the plate that was above it when it was there. And we, there, this is from the opening uh, saxogram from when the Oriental first opened and this sort of pays tribute to those electricians who had installed this and install the entire lighting system. Uh, but we knew that we had to upgrade it because sparks started flying and we, we knew that the 90 plus year old lighting board was not long for this world. So we, we fully installed a brand new lighting board backstage. And what that meant was that we were finally able to control the lights and dim the lights. And so we were able to bring back so many lights that had not been in use for so many years. Because what would happen was that as a movie theater, you're supposed to turn the lights down when the movie starts. Um, and to make that happen, uh, over the years, the light bulbs were unscrewed or they were burnt out um, because they needed to get the house dark enough. Now we can have all the lights back. So there are lights now on in the Oriental that haven't been on, some of them in decades. And so it is truly breathtaking to be in there now. And we were also able to program a lighting show so that if you're in the Oriental, uh, the lights change from red to blue throughout the course of you being in there prior to a show starting. So if you get to the Oriental before, like 20 minutes before a movie, you can see a lot of color change and it's really quite beautiful. And so this is how, some of it like with the red, when the red lights are illuminated and then eventually it transitions to blue. And you can sort of see how much more light we have down in our aisles for people to walk in and see their seats. Uh, and then uh, the one of the the other things that uh, Conrad Schmidt did for us is that there are these little creatures around the uh, the main ceiling, uh, like some people call them gargoyles, some people call them dragons. I'm not quite sure, sure exactly what they're meant to be called, but they have these illuminated green lights 
And from over the years, just from th like the, the way that these are lit is that there's basically like a little light dangling that goes down inside them and it's attached to a stick. Um, and so, but over the years as like light bulbs break and as debris falls, like a lot of these became really difficult to see. Like you could see maybe one or two. And so we actually had these cleaned out. Uh, and so now you can see all of them and it's really quite stunning. Um, so they're far more visible and present and part of our back as part of the theater. And so this is just another shot of all that, all, all the lighting. And then this next phase, uh, we will be upgrading the balcony, uh, which you can see here has some of the ceiling damage from that water leak, which we'll be repairing. The floor, it looks absolutely filthy. And that's because as Rye mentioned, we show Rocky Horror. And so there's a lot of rice on the floor in this image. So it's not usually quite this dirty, but it is quite this run down. And so we will be giving this area a nice, beautiful facelift this year. And we will also be upgrading this 1980s plastic entryway. And then at that point, the main house will be really revisioned and quite beautiful and hearkening far more back to its historic roots. And at which point I hope we can open and you guys can all come and join us and show, see movies with us. Uh, and then I, and I just wanted to take this, this last few moments before I turn it back to Jeremy and say, I wanna thank my construction team, which includes Gina Spang from DJS, who's our owner's rep, uh, Andy Klimple from uh, Altius Construction and Vincent Therese from TKWA, who are our wonderful architects and have made this all possible with us. And finally, I wanna thank Jeremy and the Milwaukee Preservation Alliance for letting me speak as along with Ryan. We've had, we were, we're, we're so happy that we could show you guys what we're doing and we're gonna to continue to make the Oriental a beautiful place and a place that is true to its, its historic roots. And I hope you all come and watch movies there. Thank you so much. Amazing, amazing. I cannot wait to get inside. I'm sure I speak for everybody on, <laughs> on the webinar when I say, I cannot wait to get back inside. It's so, so, so beautiful. I know I typed in the chat that I just love organ, uh, theater organs, and I'm super excited that that's going to be restored. Um, man, it's, uh, hearing about the, the history of movie palaces and how this plays in to that history and just what a real treasure and palace this place is and how lucky we are in Milwaukee to have a place like this still exist and, and obviously so so grateful to everyone at Milwaukee Film and TKWA for, for keeping it around and, and restoring it uh, and well I mean what a treasure and the artistry it's just it's super exciting. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I know we're at our time. Uh, if um, if people have, we got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I'm happy to happy to stay on for a couple more minutes uh, and and ask some of those questions uh, if, if 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 people want to stay on for a couple of minutes. Um, I know one um, one question I know that I that I that I pitched when I was uh, when I was putting out the publicity for our event was that George Harrison would be here today, uh, and so I was wondering if uh, I think. We can pull up pull up George Harrison and tell us a little bit about where he is in the theater. Sure thing. Let me uh, just share my screen one more time. And oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, so uh, you can see kind of right there. If you look at it just long enough, if you've done like me and you've just had a lot of time to stare at the carpet, there's George Harrison. And so. Uh, it's, it's kind of one of those bizarre things that you just have to notice by being here. So once again, we really look forward to having people come in and finding these unique little things. So if everyone is wandering around and staring at their feet, they're, they're really looking for George Harrison. <laughs> uh, yeah. That are easier than a magic eye for me. <laughs> um, one of the one of the questions I know that was in the chat. I know a lot of the questions in the chat were, were answered. Um, but I know one of them, and you addressed a lot of these. Were there any other kind of fun architectural surprises or things that you discovered uh, in, uh, in in the 
restoration and maybe that some of the other architects maybe could could jump in or anyone there any, any kind of fun discoveries I mentioned a few of mine like with the seed standards but I'd love to hear if Vince or Therese have any for them uh, yeah Kristen thanks um, there was an image that was shown earlier um, how incredibly beautiful the stage curtain was and contrast that to the just solid red color curtain now that always felt kind of odd and out of scale in terms of level of detail. And we really understood that when we saw the historic photos and how it was so at home in the theater. And for those that um, have been there, there's actually a remnant of that curtain. There is the valence that's still there today. It gives you just a sense of what that curtain was like. It was incredibly detailed, hand embroidered. There were jewels that were sewn into that curtain. Um, the, uh, the detail was absolutely astounding. Yeah, there you, you see it. Um, and, and you see how at home that curtain feels in this space. And, and that's something that uh, is um, on the wish list of something in the future. Um, so that's, that was one of um, our discoveries as Therese and I were looking through historic photos. And, and Therese, you probably have another story or two to share on your end. One of the things I was thinking about was um, those of you that have been at the theater for a long time, but before we did the bathroom restoration, women had to go upstairs to use the, the women's restroom. And uh, in some of our research recently, we've found that, that there's sort of that large open room that seems sort of functionless right before you get into the women's toilet area. And we've seen reference that that was actually a nursery, um, which seemed like kind of an, an odd thing to have, um, but was apparently an amenity that was offered at the opening. Very cool. Thinking about every, every possible patron who could, you know, who would want to be at the theater and providing for them. That's cool. Uh, cool to see the um, the the curtain there as well. I know it's so beautiful. I know. I know. Um, I know a lot of those original curtains in many theaters were uh, asbestos originally, as, as fireproof. I remember seeing a. I think it's the Westlake Theater in Los Angeles. Uh, that's uh, was most recently a swap meet, I think, and right above the proscenium arch. In big letters, it says asbestos, yeah, like advertising how, how safe and fireproof it was. Yeah, but we've since learned better about, <laughs> about the other side effects of asbestos. So, <laughs> so no more in the Oriental. Uh, um, excellent. Uh, a couple more quick uh, quick questions. I know and um, uh, Allison was asking um, if we know when, uh, when, we will reopen, and I'm sure there's probably some some question marks around that, uh, but uh, can address that. Sure, uh, we haven't quite firmed up our reopen date. We feel like we know that we're getting closer to it because at this point, uh, New York and LA have opened for movie theaters, and that really helps us in terms of content. Uh, and because right now there's a lot of distributors for cinema films that are holding on to their films until the pandemic lifts. And so we do feel like the pipeline for content is going to start opening up in the coming months. Uh, we know from our, project, our projected construction schedule that the balcony will be offline um, throughout the summer, but that doesn't mean that we can't open the side houses uh, because we can easily do, luckily movies take place in the night for the most part or on weekends, which is not when construction happens. Um, so we will be determining that in the coming months, but. We hope to see you all back at the movies within this year. Awesome, thank you. We can't can't wait to get back. <laughs> um, quick follow up um, for for Therese regarding the nursery, clarifying that it was a nursery, like a place where you would leave your baby, or a room for mothers to nurse in. The clarifying question. It's a really good question, and, and I'm. As far as we know, that's not abundantly clear. It, it doesn't seem like there was someone that was stationed there to watch your children for you. Um, but it, to the degree that of the research that we found, it was just labeled as such. And so I think our interpretation of that was perhaps that it was a space you could take your kids if they were being loud. Yeah. Kind of a, a, an extra answer to that is that the balcony was uh, ideally for kids and their mothers. So 
it, generally speaking, that's where they would be, uh, whatever that might mean by 1927 standards. Yeah, yeah, I know it was not terribly uncommon. I know from other theaters that I've that I've researched in the past to have uh, to have these rooms for, um, yeah, for for nursing mothers. I've seen pictures of some uh, old theaters that had like kids' playrooms as well that had like elephants and clowns and 